Government and the PUP back in court today. You'll hear the FinSec explain his $100 million hopes. And bail for the man who killed Nestor Vasquez Jr. Who says it's not right. Plus, we'll tell you what's the new name for the former Paslo building. Also, rage from the tourism village. Local tour guides and operators say the cruise crumbs aren't enough to feed their families. We've got details of these and other stories in our newscast for tonight, Thursday, November 21st, 2019. Good evening. With your news, I'm Indira Craig. far and near. This season, make more calls, send more texts, share all your Christmas experiences because the more you share, the more chances you have to win in Diddy's Grand Christmas Raffle where the grand prize is an amazing 2020 Wingle 7. Pick up that Christmas device from Digi or sign up for DigiNet and you also qualify. Postpaid customers, you too can spread that Christmas cheer and win. Just ensure that your bill is paid up. With over $60,000 in cash and prizes, there's so many reasons for you to share that Christmas feeling with everyone. The more you share, the more chances you have to win. Drawing date December 24 at 3 p.m. This season, share all the joy with Digi and win. Christmas bright with an easy credit loan from Atlantic Bank. Apply today and enjoy low interest rates, convenient repayment terms, and make no principal payments up to two months. With every approved loan, get a chance to win one of our 12 fantastic prizes. For more details, visit atlabank.com. Atlantic Bank, making your holidays brighter. Born for all, the mechanic in Belmo Pan, the chef in San Pedro. Even though things change, we continue to be for all. Coca-Cola, no sugar. For you, who wants to drink one more. For you, who wants to share everything with your son. And for you, that always wants more. Coca-Cola, no sugar. For everyone, since always. Collect four mark crowns and form the word goal and exchange them for an official Coca-Cola football at any B&B sales center. 12 ounce participating packages of Coca-Cola Original, Coca-Cola, no sugar, Fanta, and Sprite. Welcome to RFNG Insurance's Educational Series. Our aim is for you to understand insurance and how it works. Today, we will be discussing the importance of insuring your contents. Most homeowners insurance policies don't automatically cover the contents of your house. Content insurance is insurance that pays for damages to or loss of your personal possessions while located in your home. It is important to have enough insurance to cover everything. Go through every room and make a list of what you have and take photos. You might be surprised at how much stuff you have. Make sure the amount that you're insuring for will be enough to cover the replacement cost of all items in your home. You might need to declare valuable items separately to the insurance company. Some policies don't cover these items or limit how much you can claim to replace them. A valuable item might be paintings and other valuable pieces of art such as carvings, statues, etc. as well as jewelry and watches. 
Thanks for joining us. If you need more information or clarification on the topics we have covered, contact us at 223-5734. Our Finji Insurance, it pays to get it right. Remember again, at time for Brother Summit's monumental 36th anniversary sale, tiles, paint, power tools, fans, lights, grout, thin set, and much more, 15 to 40% off all November long. So much things on sale, it's too much for this ad. And mark your calendars for Saturday, November 23rd from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. for our first ever Super Yard Sale. With lots of good stuff going cheap, cheap, plus entertainment. So come in and celebrate Brothers Habit's 36th anniversary with great deals and huge savings all November long. Call, Facebook, WhatsApp, or email for more details. No tricks, no illusions. This smart sim is all you need to make the switch to your full service telecom provider. Smart. No need to purchase a new device. Just swap your digital sim and join the smart network. You'll enjoy the best rates on calls, text, and data. Swap your digital sim with a free smart sim at no cost to you. Every month for three months, you will get three days of unlimited calls and text, plus 200 megabytes of data on your new smart sim. It's time to get smart. Distributed by Price Premier Products Limited, importers and wholesalers of fine quality products. Robert is the Deputy Prime Minister. He is the Deputy Leader of the UDP. He knows the UDP. And he says they are corrupt. We have always been a party that boasts uh, our integrity and our honesty. And where that is not found, uh, I feel uh, compelled to to uh, make sure that that is flushed out. Faber said it again just this week. You know what, the politicians corrupt by the way. And I don't have no problem saying it. Yes, there's a lot of corruption. If Patrick Faber says you can't trust the UDP, then he knows what he's talking about. Believe him. Enough is enough. No more corruption. No more UDP. <laughs> Amazing. and do more of what you love to do this November with NextGen. Get free installation, free reconnection, and two months free Devo 3 rental when you sign up. Set your holiday season in motion and choose from a wide selection of movies, series, and local programming, all in high definition and on demand. Stay connected with our new fired up internet speeds up to 150 megabytes per second and find the best online holiday deals and special offers. Gear up for this season. Reconnect and install for free today. Next Gen, powered by Central TV and Internet. Last night, we brought you coverage of the lawsuit that leader of the opposition, John Bersenio and Julius Espat, the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, brought against Prime Minister Dean Barrow and his administration. They say that Prime Minister Barrow, acting as the Minister of Finance, has engaged in the unlawful spending of $1.3 billion in public funds. As we told you, they claim he failed to get prior parliamentary approval for the spending of all that money and that he tried to legitimize those expenditures by going to Parliament and passing supplementary appropriations to cover the amounts that were spent years prior to that. 
That old practice of spending money and then accounting for it years after the fact is, as we told you, a common practice that administrations of both political parties have made routine. These claimants assert that this is a bad practice that needs to stop. But they also have a big issue with the way the Prime Minister got access to those $1.3 billion. Part of the PUP's complaint against the PM is that he got access to those monies from the Consolidated Revenue Fund through what is known in the Finance Ministry as special warrants. According to the rules, these special warrants is that they are designed to be executed when the country is facing an emergency, such as a natural disaster. The attorneys say that the Belize Constitution contemplates these type of emergencies as expenses which are, quote, urgent and unforeseen, end quote. The PUP's case against the PM is that he abused these special warrants by declaring the public spending of those $1.3 billion as urgent and unforeseen. They also say that urgent and unforeseen in the Constitution has a specific meaning, which the Prime Minister used loosely. So, for the majority of today's hearing, the attorneys for both sides got a chance to make submissions and attempt to convince the Chief Justice of their position. Senior counsel Andrew Marshallek argued the case of the claimants and he went with the evidence to try and convince the Chief Justice of their perspective. When the case concluded this evening, we got a reaction from the claimants. I am, I am glad that I was part of this. Um, from what I understood, we had four claims and two of them the attorney conceded, meaning the, the important one was the Arita, in the Arita General's report, the 2012-213 report, where she stated that um, money was spent without um, Parliament's approval. Um, they conceded, so they said that was unconstitutional. It was not the judge saying that, it was the defense attorney saying that. that they agreed that it was unconstitutional. The second one was um, all the supplementary allocations that was listed, which is close to $1.3 <coughs> billion. Dollars. They conceded that that was also unconstitutional. The two other um, topics that were discussed was the unconstitutionality of the Finance and Audit Act reform when it pertains to using a contingency fund instead of the consolidated fund. That had arguments back and forth. Um, I don't see how they can win that one, but that judgment is reserved for that. And the other one is the, um, the legality or the, the, it, if it is constitutional, what they did with the amendment to the, um, the Petro-Carib Loan Act. <coughs> Um, that one had, had um, debates back and forth and I still cannot see how, they will, how the judge will go against that one. But, so we can definitely say that two or four they have considered already on the unconstitutionality. What was, what was revealing to me was that they are not saying that they were right now, they have agreed that they were wrong, no, they are pleading to the court and asking for leniency. Because we don't leave Caribbean nation and that's how we do things, unlike the first world countries. And that was surprising that a, a defense attorney for the government of Belize would use as, as, as a pleading factor with the judge. So that, that's, that's how I saw it. And some people may be asking, well, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Are you, do you want to tie your hand? Because many people believe that we will form the next government. I think it is very important for not only this government, but for future governments to ensure that we work within the budget, that we work within the constitution, that we work within the law, and that we should always be held accountable for our deeds, for our actions, and that if we do not follow the law, that we should be held accountable for it and have to pay whatever the law prescribes. Sir, there is a strong suggestion that from, uh, at least from the FinSec, that some of the, the supplementary appropriations they had to um, work on was inherited from the previous PUP administration. What, what's your comment to that? Well, it, it doesn't matter where it came from. I mean, if it was wrong then, it is wrong, double wrong today. As I mentioned yesterday, the Prime Minister, when this happened under our government, was very critical, very vocal about it. And he made a commitment that it would not happen under his government. 
Fast forward to today, now we have $1.3 billion that was spent um, on the, his watch that was not properly, that was, did not follow the process and did not get the, 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 um, the parliamentary approval or the House approval at the, at the right time. They spend the money, then they come and, and, and tell us, well, this is what we have done with your money. It was wrong then, it's double wrong today. So since the PUP's case is that the PM misused the special warrants to spend the money, we asked one of their attorneys to explain why this contingency fund issue is so important to the governance of the country for urgent and unforeseen expenses. Here's how he described it. The whole provision in the Constitution is for an appropriation bill, which would be the approval of the amount estimated for revenue and expenditure for every year. The Constitution goes on to provide that you should create a contingency fund, which is like if you're doing any project, you're always billing a 5 or a 10% contingency for any cost overrun. In the case of the Constitution, what it says is that if there is urgent and unforeseen expenditure that is required, so it is something that you have a hurricane, you have a massive fire, you have a flood or anything like that, which could not have been predicted, but you have to deal with it. The amount given to a particular ministry, let's say roads are damaged, the budget for roads would be X million, but because of this particular you know, natural disaster, you need to spend more. You go to the contingency fund, which parliament has already approved as a part of the budget. You use it. You come back to Parliament and report that you have spent money out of that contingency fund that had already been approved. We now need money to replenish the fund. That is the language of the Constitution. And the reason for that is that Parliament wants to approve the budget and a limited amount for any contingency that is urgent and unforeseen. And when you use it, you bring it back to Parliament to report and then you get it replenished. The point of the matter is, which the leader and the deputy have tried to establish in this case, is that for too long, the government has been spending hundreds of millions of dollars without accountability. And secondly, contrary to section 117 of the constitution, it is remarkable in my view that my learned friend, counsel for the government, would come to court and concede an unconstitutional act on behalf of the government and yet ask the Chief Justice to show them leniency. When you contravene the highest law of the land, there are consequences for it. And you cannot, in my respectful view, ask the court to say, we broke the constitution, but you know, just give you a pat on the wrist. Year after year, from 2004 to present, Every year there has been urgent and unforeseen expenditure in every ministry. You have to ask yourself whether or not that is true. And I think you know what the obvious answer is. But he has to say that because that is the only way he can try to legitimize what the Prime Minister did. You cannot issue a special warrant unless something is urgent and unforeseen. Huge amounts, hundreds of millions were paid on salaries. That is not urgent and unforeseen. As we told you last night, the biggest reveal of this case so far is that the Barrow administration has failed to get any parliamentary approval prior or after the fact to account for close to $100 million in public funds. That money has been spent, but no appropriation bill have been passed to account to Parliament for it, as is required by the law. The financial secretary made that admission in court yesterday when he was being cross-examined by senior counsel Eamon Courtney. This is a significant failure that legitimizes the PUP's case that going to parliament for supplementary appropriation bills long after public monies have been spent is a very bad idea. We challenged the financial secretary on it today and here's how that conversation went. Okay, this is the audit report for financial year 2012-2013. Uh, indeed, and I use the word slippage, we have not put the supplementary request to the House. To put things in perspective, that supplementary, 100 million may sound like a lot of money, but it's about 10% of the overall budget for that year. Uh, and in fact, when, when you look at all this, the supplementaries they list, still it's within six, seven or 8% of the total spending over that period, which uh, the, the average budget is about 900 million a year. Uh, 
and this is going back what to 2000. 2005 or so. Isn't that, that somewhat trivializing it though by reducing it to simply 10%? No, I mean I'm saying look that is it, it, it may sound like a big figure but if, when you put it in perspective it is still within a, a, a single digit digit number uh, and remember these these supplementaries go back beyond the life of the current government in fact the government the current government is doing supplementaries that they inherited so, so to speak huh? but nevertheless uh, indeed, the supplementaries have been late in being put to the House, and in fact, we've conceded that. Um, it's been an, an age-old practice, okay, we want to fix it. In fact, if you look, you can see that the frequency of the supplementaries have been coming faster, indeed a little late. But I remember as a young man many years ago, we did 10 years worth of supplementaries at, at, at one time. Sir, but $100 million not being covered by a supplementary seems like a dangerous thing, uh, accounting after the fact. It seems like something you would not want to practice. What would have happened had there not been any oversight to catch this $100 million? The, the thing, remember, it's a lot of it is it's divided into three areas. There's a recurrent, there's a cap, capital two, capital three. I really need to dive down, d delve down to find out where these number, numbers came from. And the problem is that once it drew out to our attention, we tried to get it corrected, but then some, some, the key member of my staff got sick. Once we caught up that in fact that year had not been addressed, we put a, a team together on it. The head of the team got sick. Uh, it's been out for some time. Uh, we're trying to do it without him, huh? And we will finish it by the end of the year. But remember, the Ministry of Finance is perhaps one of the smallest ministries in the, in, in the government, head uh, uh, numbers-wise, with, with, with you know numbers-wise with uh, per, you know staff, and we have some big responsibilities. I'm not saying it as an excuse, but it's just the reality of the situation. Huh? What is your personal opinion of this continued practice? Wouldn't you, as ideally, a as a finance, ideally you want, you, you ideally you'd want to to to, um, to, to do it. Uh, in compliance with, with, with regulations and so I should also tell you that um, that in, in fact uh, while we may be late in submitting it's a procedural matter but there's no mention and I should stress clearly that there's no mention that there's any mispro misappropriation or impropriety with use of the money. The Chief Justice has reserved judgment in this case for January 21st of next year and do we take a break now when we come back, we'll tell you about the controversial bail for Colin Francis, a man accused of stabbing a psychiatric nurse and killing Nesta Vasquez Jr. Don't go away. Martin customers, this is your chance to win big with Smart and Quartz Mega Raffle 2019. Starting November 6th through December 23rd, for every $5 you use on calls, texts, data, and roaming bundles for the week, you get one raffle entry to win weekly amazing prizes. Or you can purchase a chance for just $1 by sending an SMS to you win. 8946. On November 11th, you can win a one night stay for two at Sunny Nasa Hotel, $100 certificate from Pink's Boutique, $500 cash from Innovative Signs, and a power washer from Brothers Habet. Then on November 18th, win a one night stay for two at Hopkins Bay Resort, round trip tickets for two from My Island Air, plus $200 cash from Smart. On November 25th, win a one night stay for two at Sunbreeze Hotel. Round trip tickets for two from Tropic Air plus a mega basket from Grace Kennedy. On December 2nd, win a one night stay for two at Shaw Creek. A family photo shoot with night and day plus dinner for two at Bird's Eye. Then on December 9th, win a round trip ticket from United Airlines plus a thousand dollar savings account from Belize Bank. And on December 16th, you can win an iPhone 11 plus. Round trip tickets for four courtesy San Pedro Belize Express. This mega raffle giveaway doesn't end there. On December 23rd, one lucky winner gets to walk away with a mega gift. $10,000 in furniture and appliances, courtesy of Quartz and Smart, just in time for the Christmas. So every Monday, you could be a lucky winner with Smart. Benny's Deal Alert season is here, and we have some great deals for you. Deals, deals, and more deals. From now up until December 31st, enjoy Deal Alert discounts on our line of paints, such as BH Paints. 
texture light paints and tropical colors paints. Deal alert markdowns will also be applied on a wide selection of tiles, lights and fans, tools, appliances, and much more. And remember, whenever you make a purchase, you get double tickets to enter our cash giveaway draw on December 21st to win $10,000. That's right, it's a deal alert. It's a Venice deal alert. So shop now, get great deals, and your tickets for the chance to win the $10,000 grand prize only at, at Benny. Benny. shares, uploads, and downloads, calls, texts, gaming, and creating, teaching, and learning, because you're why we do what we do. Thanks for being a DigiFan. Digi, always more. Original improved Duracell with a new look in packaging. When you think dependability, when you think long lasting, when you think power, there is only one name that matters. That name is Duracell. The world's longest lasting battery with authentic Duralop preserved technology. Original product, original quality with a new look in packaging. Authentic, dependable, and longer lasting Duracell. Distributed by Price Premier Products Limited importers and wholesalers of fine quality products. Christmas is a season to create wonderful memories with your family and friends. That's right. Share more special moments this season with Atlantic Bank. Save time for what matters most by using Go Mobile, Atla Express, Atlantic Online, and your Visa debit card. Use any of these Bank Your Way services for a chance to win one of 50 amazing Christmas prizes. You can win a 65 inch Smart TV, 60 inch Smart TV, Samsung 10. Sony PlayStation, gift certificate, and many more fantastic prizes. Atlantic Bank, making your holidays brighter. Patrick Faber is the Deputy Prime Minister. He is the Deputy Leader of the UDP. He knows the UDP, and he says they are corrupt. We have always been a party that boasts uh, our integrity and our honesty and where that is not found uh, I feel uh, compelled to 
to uh, make sure that that is flushed out. Faber said it again just this week. You know what, the politicians corrupt by the way, and I don't have no problem saying it. Yes, there's a lot of corruption. If Patrick Faber says you can't trust the UDP, then he knows what he's talking about. Believe him. Enough is enough. No more corruption. No more UDP. <laughs> Amazing. Take a journey with us to endless possibilities. Our future as a country is now. DigiNet Boost is countrywide. Taking Belize into the future. A nationwide technological evolution. As the most advanced fiber connection, DigiNet Boost is a step forward into a modern world. Belize is powered by DigiNet. DigiNet Boost, now available countrywide. As one of the largest cable and internet providers in Belize, CBC strives to provide our customers with the highest standards of quality, value, and service in all aspects of cable TV and internet. Monitoring our systems closely, our technicians combine creative planning and state-of-the-art technology with years of experience and training to develop and provide the most reliable and advanced cable and internet service to exceed your expectations. For CBC and our team of talented engineers, technicians and customer service representatives, delivering less than the very best is never an option. Nestor Vasquez Jr.'s family is outraged tonight after the man who viciously beat him in a Queen Street police station cell block number no. 5 five months ago was offered bail. That brutal beatdown led to Vasquez's death two days later. Francis has not been charged for Vasquez's murder, but still he was offered bail of $8,000 for attempted murder in relation to another incident where he stabbed nurse Agustina Eligio days before he killed Vasquez. Vasquez's brother Jules gave the media his reaction to the news and discussed the inadequacies of the justice system. We have received the news that Mr. Francis has been offered bail and I am told the most recent is that he hadn't met it but my family is dismayed, alarmed and angry that Mr. Francis, who killed my brother, is receiving bail when he has not been charged five months after, more than five months after the murder of my brother. He has not been charged for any offense. This is not a case where we have to find a who or we're not sure. There were only two people in that cell. One came out unconscious, comatose and died in 48 hours. Never knew consciousness again after going into that cell. So the other person has to be responsible. We are so dismayed that no charge has been brought. But we are also so alarmed at this justice system because this man is a danger. In one week, he tried to kill a nurse and he killed my brother. And I don't know under what circumstances he got bail, but what is this justice system that we can't bring a charge against a man who is clearly responsible for the death of Nestor Vasquez Jr.? It really escapes me completely how this could happen. And obviously there are a lot of emotions involved, but all we want to say is that Indeed, it may be judged that he's not mentally well enough, 
to be charged, but he was charged for attempted murder. So he must can be charged for murder. And we do believe, we are certain, that he is guilty of the murder of my brother. Of my brother. I understand, people are entitled to bail, there's a presumption of innocence. But there is no bail for murder except in exceptional cases, and this is not such a case. But he has not been charged for murder. And it's amazing to me that after so many months, that this matter still has not been brought to conclusion. When it is a clear cut case, we are demanding that Mr. Francis be charged for my brother's murder. It's time. There has been too much time. Someone has to answer for the death of my brother. His life was worth a whole lot to the family. Jules Vasquez also spoke about the potential danger Francis poses to the society. You feel a sense of personal disquiet when the person who killed your loved one, and we know he killed our loved one, is walking the streets free. That is not right. But on a larger societal level, the dangers that are associated with this man were amply demonstrated with Nurse Eligio. The police, when they brought him to court for Nurse Eligio's attempted murder, they brought him in the full uh, chains, hand and foot. That is how they protect themselves. They did not choose to do so for my, for my brother. They chose to do the opposite. The point I'm making is that the dangers have been illustrated. And it is only five months since then. I believe that it must be obvious to someone that there may be some societal risk involved in this. And I, you know, I don't want to, to say, uh, to overstate the obvious, but obviously this man has demonstrated how dangerous he is. Up to this evening, we could not confirm if Francis had met bail, but best reports say he has. His next court date is January 20th of 2020. Late this evening, the DPP told Jules that they expected to bring charges against Francis for killing Nesta Vasquez Jr. A directive for a charge is expected to be issued shortly, but at this time, police will have to find Francis. There has been a shooting in Belize City and it happened just before news time and just a few hundred feet from the Queen Street Police Station. Reports say that two men were seen running from the area near the New Road Bridge while their victim lay on the street in a pool of blood. But he survived and was rushed to the KHMH where they found that he received two headshots. One entered over his left eye and exited above the right eye while the other shot hit his lower back. His condition is not known at this time. He's reportedly a 25-year-old security guard who lives in the general area. We stress again that the shooting happened a stone's throw from the country's largest police station and within sight of two police checkpoints. There was also a shooting in the city this morning when 28-year-old Francis Arana was shot to the wrist. He was treated and released, but police say he refuses to make a statement. The report is that Arana and two others were sitting on the steps of his Lavender Street home in the Lake Independence area when an armed man approached Arana and shot him. 65-year-old Marciano Correa, charged for the April 2013 murder of 43-year-old Sisto Victorio Osorio, was freed of the charge today when a nolly pros was entered before Justice Herbert Lord. Crown Counsel Urbina said it was due to insufficient evidence. So after six years on remand, Korea was free to go. He was represented by attorney Dickie Bradley. Osorio, a resident of Libertad, was struck on his head with a blunt instrument and he died as a result of the injury he sustained. His body was found lying face down on the pavement in the village. Osorio was reportedly killed because of a family dispute. Belize Heritage Plaza, that is the winning entry in the competition to name the site where the Paslo building once stood at the corner of Queen and North Front Streets in downtown Belize City. The competition was launched in July of this year and the public was invited to make submissions and then Belizeans voted for the top six finalists. After the online polls were closed and the 313 votes that were cast were counted, Eddie Middleton's entry, Belize Heritage Plaza, got 94 votes and won first place. His prize is $800. $600 is the second place prize and that went to 
Faidra Mohammed Ali, whose entry Emancipation Plaza was close behind with 91 votes. And third place with 64 votes went to Colin Gillett with his submission, Freedom Square. He walks away with $400. Now, regarding the structure that will be built at Belize Heritage Plaza, the new two-story building will host a tourist welcome center, a vendor booths on the first floor with offices and a cafe on the second floor and a parking area in the rear. Construction commenced in June of 2019 and is projected to be completed in early 2020. It is one of five structures in the Belize City downtown that the Belize City House of Culture and Downtown Rejuvenation Project is currently investing in. Belize's top intelligence lawman is in the UK having talks with the British. A release from the British High Commissioner says that Senior Superintendent Howell Gillett is, quote, in London to hold strategic discussions with officials of UK law enforcement agencies. He is pictured at New Scotland Yard with Belize's High Commissioner to the UK, Perla Perdomo. As history records, Belize's special branch has a long and storied history with its British counterparts. In the 70s, during the internationalization of Belize's cause of nationhood, special branch was made to do the bidding of its British overlords, famously tapping the phones of Assad Showman and Juan Duran, who the British and Americans suspected of getting too cozy with leftist leaders in Nicaragua and Cuba. The Tax Services Department is the recently amalgamated cluster of the Income Tax and Sales Tax Departments. And tonight, it's running into major static from the Public Service Union. The PSU warns that all is not well within the newly amalgamated department. And the union says, quote, employees of the Belize Tax Services Department remain uneasy and not fully sensitized on the amalgamation process. Communication is poor and is indicative of a deficient change management team and strategy, which leads us to caution that the organizational changes are bound to fail. End quote. A lot of the criticism has been levied against the financial secretary, Joe Waite, who met with the union in July. Now, the union is meeting with the staff of the department, and today Waite told us he is aware and wants to address the issues. The meeting just happened yesterday evening. I have had no report as to the outcome of that meeting. But in general, uh, the unions have expressed some concerns regarding the placement of certain offices within the new amalgamated department, and we're trying to work out those issues. But beyond that, I can't really say what the specific concerns are because I have not been part of the direct dialogue. Huh? But we want to address them, okay, and we want to ensure that that there's fairness, equity, and nobody's rights are in any way stepped on. But at the same time, we have to organize the department for f along functional lines so that we can provide better services to the taxpaying public. Huh? One of the union's major complaints is that the Ministry of Finance was supposed to have set up a project steering committee with union input to manage the amalgamation, but the PSU claims it hasn't been given the notice of a single meeting. The Financial Secretary also discussed the recent news that the Economic and Financial Affairs Council of the European Union has agreed to remove Belize from the EU list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, which is the blacklist. Today, the FinSec said Belize is now in the grey list. In relation to the EU blacklisting, in terms of any funding that would have been paused that we get from them, did that happen during that short period? No. No, none at all. No, 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 no. No, no effect. Uh, well, you know, they, we're trying to comply. Uh, uh, we're now off the back blacklist. There's another uh, um, more. on the grey list, correct? Yeah. Indeed, I mean, we have to do more, more work. There'll be a meeting of the House shortly with some amendments to the bills on the tax matters. But uh, even while we were on the court blacklist, there was no defensive measures, as they call it. There was no penalties to Belize. Uh, you know. And I don't think the European Union has itself, um, has itself um, determined what is a consistent set of measures. You know, the UN, European Union it, is not all that unified when it comes to tax measures. The financial secretary was also asked about his perspective on the health of the country's economy. He noted that while everyone wants to see growth, they are mindful that this year's extended drought has hurt the nation's major industries. 
Here are the FinSex comments on that topic. The economy, of course, we, we, we would like to see more growth. I mean, that is, you know, we, we realize the drought has set us back. Uh, uh, that will have a revenue impact. Um, we're still trying to maintain within budget, trying to, to generate the surpluses that, uh, that we, 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 uh, we need to pay down our debt. The debt is stable. It's still at around 1992% uh, of, um, of GDP. We're borrowing only on, um, on, commer uh, on concessional basis. Um, and we're trying to fashion the, uh, the spending and the budget to, to, to remain within these, uh, w within these, to generate enough surplus so that we can pay down our debt. Will constituents be given Christmas cheer this year? Uh, I believe so. The Statistical Institute of Belize will release its third quarter GDP estimates next week. A 72-year-old Placencia man was swindled out of $4,000 in a bogus sale that was set up on Facebook. Alan Stamp wanted to buy a golf cart from a person who goes by the name of Thomas Young on Facebook. Young arranged to have someone meet Stamp in Belama and collect the money. But after that transaction, Young could not be found and Stamp never got his golf cart. Police told us more about the press briefing this morning. Alan Stamp, 72 years, naturalized religion of Placentia Village. Reporter, he made contact with one Thomas Young on Facebook regarding the sale of a golf cart. Arrangements were made to make a down payment of $4,000. Uh, the payment uh, was received by a male person at the Lama, uh, where he gave the person there a receipt. Uh, after the person received the money, he left, and thereafter the complainant is now unable to locate this person. Uh, or to get the golf cart uh, police are conducting an investigation to find out who this person is. We want to warn the public that uh, they should be careful and uh, ask for more details and more facts before any transaction like that is done. Uh, ask for identification and so on verify before you make any payment as such. Police have no suspects in this case. And we take a break now. When we come back, you'll hear about the discontent outside the Fourth Street Tourism Village. Don't go away. Christmas is that time of the year when we spread that holiday cheer with our family and friends far and near. Season, make more calls, send more texts, share all your Christmas experiences because the more you share, the more chances you have to win in Digi's Grand Christmas Raffle where the grand prize is an amazing 2020 Wingle 7. Pick up that Christmas device from Digi or sign up for DigiNet and you also qualify. Postpaid customers, you too can spread that Christmas cheer and win. Just ensure that your bill is paid up. With over $60,000 in cash and prizes, there's so many reasons for you to share that Christmas feeling with everyone. The more you share, the more chances you have to win. Drawing date December 24 at 3 p.m. This season, share all the joy with Digi and win. continue to enhance customer experience, the Social Security Board is proposing the use of biometrics. Biometrics is the measurement of a person's unique physical characteristics, such as fingerprints and facial features, used to establish and verify that you are who you say you are. Biometrics will ensure services are provided to the right person at the right time, making customer transactions easier and secure. Identity management with biometrics will be easier. It allows us to quickly and accurately confirm your identity when accessing any of our services, from the moment a person is registered to the moment the payment of a benefit is made. With biometrics, fraud will be minimized by easily identifying those who pose a security risk. The enhancement of customer services to you means no more filling out of forms, no more presentation of an ID, 
and decrease waiting time. Your convenience and your information security is our priority. Social Security Board, safeguarding you, your family, your future. What is Bunny thinking about right now? Nothing. Because there's a new Duracell battery. It now lasts even longer. So now you can think even less about batteries. And so can Duracell Bunny. Duracell lasts longer, much longer. Distributed by Price Premier Products Limited, importers and wholesalers of fine quality products.
In 2010, it was big news when San Ignacio police found 20 kilos or 46 pounds of cocaine concealed under a vehicle driven by Curzal resident Carlos Gibson. It was coming over from Guatemala. Well, almost a decade later, reports say Gibson has been fined for the drugs. He reportedly pleaded guilty at Belmopan Supreme Court and was fined $25,000 to be paid by 30th of June of next year or in default face two years imprisonment. The Fort Street Tourism Village was once a vibrant disembarkation point for cruise ship visitors, a place that bustled with excited new arrivals who freely interacted with the locals, purchasing their products and services and providing many of them with an independent means of making a living from tourism. But according to the tour operators and vendors that remain active in the FSTV, those days are long gone. They say that their opportunities to live from cruise tourism revenue has been worsening for three years now. And according to them, the cruise and big tour companies have stifled their business ventures, even resorting to smear campaigns. And this week, as what is supposed to be the cruise tourism high season is approaching, the frustration is building among those vendors and tour operators. They today share their plight with Cherise Halsa. There were three ships in the Belize City Harbor today. Those ships brought approximately 6,000 people to our shores. They're here to visit ancient Maya temples, go cave tubing, take a city tour in a horse-drawn carriage, and maybe pick up a souvenir or two. But local tour operators and vendors from the Fort Street Tourism Village say that they aren't getting any of that action. Every passenger that comes in, the government collects his share. We don't make a dollar. Every one of us out here goes home daily for the past three months without a dollar. Some of us are fortunate. Other ends, some of, some of us are unfortunate. Nothing to do. And while arrivals at the Fort Street Tourism Village have declined since State Bank opened up in Placentia, these tour operators say that the downward turn for them started three years ago. We have seen our um, income plummet roughly about 90% um, uh, throughout the past uh, two to three years. And one of the primary reasons is that the uh, contracted operators have taken more than 80% of the guest arrivals uh, into our country on tours. And also the, um, the blackmailing and blacklisting of personnel inside of the FSTV um, village right behind me. They are saying that don't take tours with us because our vehicles is not safe, we have no insurance, and if they get left in Belize, we would not be able to fly them back to their uh, destination, which is totally untrue because the same tour operators and tour guides inside of the FSTV, they have the same license and insurance that we have here on the outside. But given the drastic year-on-year -year decline in revenue that they claim to be facing, will their sector of the tourism industry still be viable in the coming months? Since they put up the gate about 2005, we stopped make money. They told the tourists a whole lot of bull that don't come on the outside because they go to rob you. And but all the tourists that is inside the goddamn gate still got to come out here to go on tours. So how comes they don't rob those one who is walking, who goes on tours to the Alton Hall, to the Maya Mountain? Everything they got to do from out the gate, they got to come out here. So we need them to stop telling the tourists lie, to get all the money to go back to wherever they come from. And we need money in Belize because we are poor people down here. We are third world people and we are suffering underneath the government too. He got to go. It's not a lot, but it can help us, man, our kids and family and take care of the bills. But now we can't even take care of the kids then. We got to cut the food shortly so we can pay our bills and stuff because tourists is not like before. Tourists is not like before in Belize. It's getting worse. The area we are we there, they're not a direct no tourist to we down here so you know we 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 don't make the get crumbs and thing you know and now no them no crumbs step on the table now for we we know they make no money like that. This are just our front the government and and, and the big people say they know the front because nothing not shingle down to we, to the poor have nuts, we not get nothing. 24 years been in the industry, this is the worst, worst, worst. When I'm talking about this is part of our economy, right? This is our industry. Reporting for 7 News, this is Sharice Halso. 
The BTB has not released the third quarter figures for cruise tourism arrivals. Last night on the news, we had extensive coverage of the Children's Parliament, where 31 youth leaders got to blast the government on any number of topics. But what was the number one area of grievance? Well, it was health. 11 of the 31 youth reps spoke about inadequacies in the healthcare system. Failures in education were close behind. Ten of the representatives spoke about that, including the one from Collet, which is the seat of the real Minister of Education. Crime was next. Seven of them spoke about that, while one spoke about road safety and two about child safety. And that's all we have for you for tonight. Thanks for watching with your news. I'm Indira Craig. Remember that you can see a streaming video of this newscast at 7newsbelize.com brought to you by Digi for the best postpaid plans in the country. Do have a great night and make sure to join Courtney Weatherburn here tomorrow and I'll be seeing you back on Monday. So.